Good morning, and thank you for joining us. We're very pleased to be joined today by Senator Eddie Lucio, longtime leader uh, in the state Senate. Um, and uh, I'd like to just jump right in, Senator. Sure. Uh, before your life as a public servant and leader in the legislature, you were an educator. Can you tell us a little bit about that and share what led you to step into that life as an educator? That was one of the greatest um, um, moments in my life when I was stepped into the gym uh, where I was a physical education instructor and uh, also into the uh, dressing room of football and basketball and track. Uh, I was a coach uh, for four years before I, I entered the, uh, you know, the political arena. Uh, but I want I want you to know the reason I decided to become a teacher was actually in the sixth grade. I was in the back of the room talking a little too much. Maybe I was getting ready to debate things back there. But my teacher says, get up there, Eddie, and work uh, problem number 17. And uh, it was it was a teen. I remember that much it was way back. But I remember he says, just work it out. I, I want I want to see if you studied last night. And sure enough, I worked it out beautifully. I broke it down. I was real good at math, thank God. But I thank my dad and, and mom because they would make us sit at the kitchen table. There was 10 of us. Well, I'm a family of 10 kids, six boys, four girls. So anybody that got a place somewhere in the house to be able to sit down and study was fortunate. Yeah. A lot of people had to go out in the back porch or something at times. But seriously, um, I, I, I did my homework, I broke it down. And when we went out to the playground, uh, my classmate says, hey, Eddie, uh, you broke it down beautifully. You, you did a better job than she did. Don't tell her that, please. Uh, she'll, she'll hate me for it. <laughs> but that kind of sent a message to me that I could mm -hmm. communicate uh, with, with uh, young people. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I could communicate with my own classmates, I could do it as an adult with, with children. And uh, I, I just, uh, there's seven of us out of 10 that became professional teachers um, because oh, my wow. mom and dad thought that being a professor, you know, being a teacher yeah. was something huge and big back in the 60s. Yeah. Uh, so um, that, that was what um, kind of took me in that direction. Uh, and I learned a lot about my community the families um, uh, whose children that I, I taught and uh, what came from in the inner city of Brownsville and, and they were poor kids and but but they were you know they were kids that were being taught love and and other things that they needed to be able to make it in the world and I I I did my best to try to communicate with them what the good things were and to stay you know, keep a straight line, keep focus and, and do the right thing. So we had, I had a successful teaching career, thank God. Yeah, that's wonderful. What did you enjoy most about being a teacher, about being in the classroom and working with children? Challenging my, my kids, I guess. I mean, the first, the first day of school was an incredible day. Mm -hmm. I remember walking into the gym and uh, the whole left side of the gym was full of boys. Mm -hmm. I, I had the boys physical education classes. Yeah. And there was 104 kids in there there was, uh, that, that I, I didn't realize were all mine. Wow. I waited for the office girl. She finally showed up and with the roll call, attendance sheets, we would call them, yeah. on a, a manila cover. And I went over to Lucio, Lucio, and they, they were all mine. I said, and that's the first time I prayed as a teacher. I said, <laughs> I need your help, uh, Lord, uh, God, please help me. Send me, you know, a, a message. And he did. I, I walked up and down. I, I chose 10 of the worst looking guys. I mean, meanest guys, I should say, not bad looking, but meanest guys that were out there, you know, kind of eyeing me. I had seventh, eighth and ninth graders together. And I, I said, get in my office. I need to talk to you. And they followed me kind of grumpy saying, hey, I didn't do anything, sir. And just and then I told them, I says, and it just came out. Thank God. It just I'm going to need. 10 squad leaders, captains, and I want you all to be my captains so that um, we can have games and, and you're, you're going to do well. You, mm -hmm. you dress up, you're, you're a leader, and uh, you'll be able to, to get a good grade here. So, so the six weeks went by, 
And they did get a good grade. And then all of a sudden I get a call from the office. The principal wants to see me immediately. So I ran over there and there was a, the parents of the students were there wanting to know why their kid got an A. They had never gotten an A in anything. They would, these were the problem kids. You know, yeah. These are the kids that yeah. you, know, uh, you had issues with. Uh, and I told them, I said, well, they, they followed directions, they dressed out, they, they were leaders and they did real good. You should be very proud of them. And it, it taught me something that I didn't learn in college, you know, that you, you need to give those that we feel sometimes we want to put aside for some reason or another, give them a chance, challenge them and make them part of, 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 of the activities that you want to have for your, for your classroom. And I smiled at him and that, that kind of, that always brought him back to me yeah. instead of being a grumpy old man. And I was young, but I could have been a grumpy old man. Yeah. Yeah. I was young. I was 20 years old. Okay. Yeah. Wow. See, so that's really interesting. You tried something different. Sure. It was very okay. innovative. And what did you learn from the experience as an educator that you then brought to education policy when you like became a state leader? Well, after talking to many parents during the four years that I was a teacher and visiting them at home. So, so I could work with them with their, with their boys. Uh, Cause I was the coach, you know, in those four years as well for football, basketball and track. I, I learned to listen to the parent. I, I learned to, 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 to um, take, take a good look at, at, at every one of my students and, and try to help them as much as I could. That, that helped me realize that there were issues out there that needed to be addressed in education, healthcare. Yeah. Um, some of the parents uh, didn't have a, a job or a meaningful job. And so an economic development issues and all the issues that, that um, you know, have an impact on the family, the Texas family, regardless of the socioeconomic status, I felt I needed to work you know, later on with the business community because they were the ones creating these jobs that I wanted for my my kids' yeah. parents and all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you just have to be a well-rounded type of person, man or woman, to, to serve in the legislature. And the way you can do that is not only open your mind, but also open your heart. Yeah, yeah. And in working with families, I mean, say specifically over the last couple of years, we're facing a lot of challenges that families haven't faced, or if they've faced them before, they've been amplified and intensified, right? Um, what have you seen are the most significant challenges for Texas school kids today? Well, I, we address some of those uh, difficult yeah. uh, situations. Um, I, I, um, the more I, I, I looked at things as a legislator, the more I saw where we needed to make sure that our, our children came to school with food in their in their mm -hmm. stomachs. I mean, for them to be able to have, and if they weren't eating, to make sure they did eat so they wouldn't end up in the in the nurse's lounge uh, or office and or or you know just um, uh, not be able to learn because mm -hmm. they were hungry. Um, I didn't want that uh, for my kids or anybody's kids anywhere in the state. Uh, so, and, and I have to tell you that I, I, I tried for a while to tr try to pass some meaningful legislation, but I, I just uh, didn't get the support I needed or I didn't have, uh, I didn't get the hearing on, yeah. on a bill that I wanted. But when Dan Patrick showed up, we debated uh, uh, one issue that made us friends forever. And, and he had a bill that, that, would, that would really um, in my opinion, hurt the, the dreamer. And I told him, you know, you're a man of faith. You, know, you are a man of God. He was the one that actually put in God we trust. He, he led the way to put that, that saying right there above the president's uh, podium in the Senate. So I had a lot of respect for him. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, please pull your bill down. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we became pretty good friends. He was my vice chair in, um, in, in international relations and trade. I, and then when he became chairman of education, mm -hmm. he asked uh, Governor Dewhurst to make me his vice chair. He did. And that opened the door uh, for me to be able to, to address some of the issues that I had 
been looking at that needed uh, adjustment, not only in, in, in the valley on the border or the coastal mm -hmm. bend, but in other parts of the state, there's pockets of poverty all over the state. And, and I was just so happy. <laughs> he gave me a chance to put our, my bills on the, on the table. We expanded the lunch program into a breakfast program. He supported me, he helped me. I will never forget that the Lieutenant Governor, well then Senator Patrick led the way uh, as chairman of the committee to make that happen. We also passed another bill because we found out that the kids were eating when they were in school, but they weren't eating enough at home during the summertime. Okay. So we passed a bill that addressed the summertime feeding uh, for children uh, that attended schools that were over that 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 over half of the population uh, qualified for free lunch. Mm -hmm. We also required schools to open uh, their cafeterias during the summertime if they had summer activities in their schools so that the kids could eat. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a dream come true uh, for me because uh, I have many stories uh, growing up in our communities where we uh, were not that well off, but there were people even poorer than we were or less fortunate than we were. So we, we shared and it was something special. Got great stories along those lines with my family and I, but, but here in the legislature, it gave me a chance to work on public policy that uh, change, changed uh, the, uh, the way our kids um, were, were thinking uh, because they were nutritiously fit mm -hmm. um, and physically fit health-wise. So it's, it's been a, a wonderful journey along those lines. Uh, and I, I, I just hope that we can continue in that direction in the future. Yeah, and that's really interesting that, I mean, living and working and studying alongside other people in your community gave you such an awareness of people that are marginalized in our society. And that's something that we see in your legislative record across your years is a care for people that are marginalized. So you've stood up consistently to protect the sanctity of life. You've worked um, to provide for people in colonias um, along the border. You've worked to empower families in education. I'm wondering if you can share with us as a man of deep faith, like how that was passed along to you, who passed it along, and how did that stick with you and influence your, well, your time in the legislature? I had, I had parents that really, really cared for us. I mean, they were hard. We didn't realize that they were trying to keep us together. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big family, <laughs> you know, and, and we lived in, in neighborhoods that weren't, you know, um, how could I say it? Poor neighborhoods and, and the people and the kids around us, many of my friends wound up in prison. They wound up, you know, uh, just dying early, young drugs or alcoholism or whatever uh, they were involved with that, that didn't help them, you know, live a long life. Um, they would, they would tell us to get in the little car we had and we, we, we fit. I don't know how we did it, but we fit. And, uh, and they would drive us to, to the St. Joseph Catholic Church in West Brownsville. And we would always be on the first pew, always. And my, my dad would get us there 30 minutes before because he wanted us to have, have a front seat and, and be able to hear the sermon uh, and the gospel of the day. And uh, we better live it or else. Uh, I had two wonderful parents that really uh, were God-fearing people who really cared uh, for, for God and family and country. My dad preached Americanism and patriotism every day of his life. He was unbelievable. He was a disabled American veteran, veteran of all wars. And I tell you what, he says, you're an American. And of course, we're of Italian descent, Mexican descent, uh, both. And, and that secondary is, is you're an American person. He loved his state. Uh, dad was, um, was a good person, a very generous uh, man. And my mom um, loved my dad so much. You know, we, um, we were fortunate to, to see that. And once we saw that, we, we knew that that was, the, that was the road we had to take ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And so as we think about, I mean, that's amazing that it was your parents that passed that along to you and that stuck with you over the course of your entire time as a leader in the state. 
Um, I wonder as we pivot over to education and education policy, um, we're seeing in the last couple of years, parents get involved in education in a way that they haven't before, like through virtual education, like our living rooms, our kitchens became classrooms. Um, special education, special ed, yeah. you know, very important issues. Yeah, so how can we get families, um, how can we empower them and help them walk alongside their kids as they walk through their years in school and help them succeed? What can we do to help families help their children? You, you just started me off on my, on what I'm going, what I'm calling my ministry after I retire. Okay. I'm, I'm working on a ministry that, that will, will address those issues actually identify parents, uh, families that whose children are not doing that well, find out what I can do and, and my nonprofit can do to address their needs and all, whether if it's food, if it's, if it's um, better, better clothing in the, in the, in the wintertime, if they're, if they're cold. I mean, all weatherization, all the things that are important, but most important technology, you know, that, that, our children need uh, in today's world and internet service and stuff like that, that I can work with, with local leaders, the city, the city mayors and commissions, county judges, um, everyone. And, and of course, private industry mm -hmm. to see if we can, we can uh, make sure that, you know, we, we, we cover those, those, um, those, those issues that are important, you know, for those families. Um, I have a little school down there. They ran out of names, so they named a, a middle school after me, uh, Central Delusia Middle School. And I, I'm going to start with with those kids first. Uh, they they live out there by the, it's by the Brownsville International Airport, and it's it's not a rich community by by no means, no stretch of the imagination. But they're good kids, and they want to be. Um, play an integral part in society. They want to be contributors. They want to help shape our communities. I've talked to them. We sat down, and I've challenged them. And they and and I picked their brains, so I can get to know them better. And it's going to be a, a nice thing for me to do, uh, and make part of what I want to do after I retire at the end of this year. Yeah, that's wonderful, Senator. Yes. That's yeah. awesome. Um, as you think back to your time in the legislature. Is there one like flashback moment that I don't know if you wake up at night, you say, oh, that I'm proud of that. That's something to hang my hat on. You know, it, it was always um, it was always hard to get something that was super important passed because there were obviously lobbying efforts by by certain industries that didn't allow me to have the 21 votes back then mm -hmm. two thirds okay. that you needed to bring a bill up on the house on the senate floor mm -hmm. back in those days that's why i voted to change it to three pills believe it or not people think that i did it politically I said no i wanted to be able to pass more bills mm -hmm. that were meaningful um so so i had a bill that took three sessions to pass it was mm -hmm. a bill that 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 i drew up that address autistic children. What was happening in Texas is that uh, a lot of our young kids, uh, two, three-year-olds were being diagnosed with autism mm -hmm. and, and uh, they were being dropped from the insurance rolls. And they were being given those early intervention uh, treatments they needed and they're very expensive. Uh, so they were hurting, families were being broken. And uh, I saw testimony that was, Oh, wow. I mean, I, I, I seriously um, cried and along and I was so proud when I saw members of the committee cry, actually weep with the testimony that we heard. So uh, finding one senator, uh, uh, I, I won't say who lost his race and replaced by another one. I ran over to that senator's new office and I got him to be Number twenty-one. Okay. We passed that bill uh, so we could provide uh, early intervention treatments to to children with autism, three five-year-olds, and then we the following session we passed another one that extended to ten years old, mm -hmm. and now you know at the at the national level, um, there's there's you know the federal government has been able to extend it even into adulthood. So I'm pretty happy. That was to me 
one of the greatest moments to be able to do that. But the other one was a life without parole bill. And okay. even though it deals with criminal justice and all, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm against abortion. So that means I'm against the death penalty. But I realized that there's some, some folks out there that, you know, have uh, endeavored in some real bad, you know, uh, horrific type of uh, uh, acts that they've killed people and they murdered, you know, innocent people and they don't deserve uh, actually to, to, to walk the streets of society because they're too dangerous. So I thought life without parole would, would be a great thing. And again, it took me three sessions, but I finally got the 21, uh, two thirds of the, of the senators to help me. And we were able to do that. Those were the two big ones. There's others, you know, I worked on a medical school from 1990, the moment I was elected uh, as a senator, I did a seven year study and we brought the first medical school to the Valley in 1997. Wow. With the help of Bob Bullock, we funded it. We got close to $40 million that year. And uh, my colleagues didn't, couldn't believe how it had happened. And it, that's another story that you can read in my book. I will be writing a book on okay. all of that. I'll have to check out that chapter. Yeah, so that chapter, that's yeah. remarkable, Senator. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, so in each of those cases, there were multiple session initiatives, a lot of persistence that went into that. I wonder if you have guidance for legislators that are up and coming that are thinking about, you know, how can I take care of the marginalized communities that, that I represent in my district? What advice or counsel would you give them? Unfortunately, the state is so big and I, I probably couldn't run with the position I take on, mm -hmm. on issues in other parts of the state and get elected. Mm -hmm. but, but I think I'd like to send a message to those that are listening that, you know, the sanctity of life is, is not a, a partisan issue. It's not pro-Democrat or, or pro-Republican. It's, 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 a, it's an issue that all of us should embrace. Um, the, the, just the, the, you know, the, the killing of a, of a child, for lack of better, a better term, before it is born uh, is, is something horrific. And something worse was happening. Some of these children were being, in an abortion trial, were being born alive and they were being left there on the table to run out of air, or they were putting a needle in their little lungs and, and actually bringing them to death. Uh, we passed a bill to make sure that they got all the medical attention necessary to keep them alive. And that was a, a proud moment. Uh, uh, my son and I um, voted together on that bill. I was so pleased and so happy. He's, he served 16 years. He's also retiring this year. And uh, this is my 36th. And of, of a lot, the heartbeat bill, the Santa Gran bill, all those where you saw Governor Patrick, Dan Patrick, take a, an incredible lead as, uh, on those issues. I joined with them to, just to prove that we could do things together. Mm -hmm. we're, in, we're in this together to, to try to make Texas safer, to try to make Texas better to educate our kids, to make sure that nobody dies because they can't afford to live. All these things are important. So uh, to me, it, it's, um, I would advise anyone wanting to run that, to, to, to remember this in 1970, when my dad told me when I stepped into that arena for the first time, he says, son, people don't care how much you know, they wanna know how much you care. And, and that's what, people that want to run and, and serve in public office, whether it's a school board, city commission, county commission, or the state legislature or Congress, they, they got to, they have to care. They have to really truly care and, and, and not, not follow a state or national agenda that, that's a, of a political nature of any kind. A party's agenda is fine, but, but when it comes to certain issues like abortion, all of us should be pro-life. I, and I hope to, to live to see that someday. Yeah, that's amazing, Senator. Yeah. And there's one last question. Sure. So as you look around 
society today and everything that's going on, there's lots of people who are very pessimistic, but um, we have hope that our best days are ahead of us, that there is a lot of promise in the children that we have, um, and that as they become the next generation of leaders, that they will lead right. Texas and the United States to better days than we've ever seen. Um, as you look around our society and our communities, what gives you hope that our best days are ahead of us? I think what, what really gives me hope is, is to see so many uh, committed legislators that I have grown to know that want to make it possible for everyone to be impacted in a positive way. And that that gives me hope. That It gives me hope when my grandchildren come to me and they talk to me um, about, about wanting to help their neighbor. Uh, it, it gives me hope when I when I see people reaching out and helping the less fortunate. Uh, our teachers who are unbelievably important. Our counselors, our public school counselors don't get enough credit. Uh, um, there's one issue that we need to hopefully see us tackle, and that is to change the ratio of students to counselor. Mm -hmm. uh, right now it's so super high, 450, 500. There's one school that has one counselor with 900 students in my district. That, that just out of sight, out of reach, you need to have it down to 250 to 300 per, per counselor mm -hmm. so that they can help these. Uh, so if we could pass that, that would give me great hope that we're gonna be able to help those in need. Yeah. And, and there's so many other things. Uh, we, it, it's not all gloomy. You know, we, we have wonderful things that, are, that um, we're gonna see happen. But I think people should always remember that God has a plan. He had a plan for me. I, I never thought after living in government housing for a year and a half, two as a kid, that I would ever, you know, you know work and represent people at the state capitol and work with every corner of the state to impact their community. So uh, it gives me hope knowing there are people like me that can get an education and can get the necessary background to come up here and serve. And there will be a lot of wonderful people in the future. My challenge to them is to, to please never lose sight of the fact that uh, we are a nation, a great nation under God. And, and Texas uh, had to do it. I think we changed it two or three times when we, we had a Pledge of Allegiance to the state flag, but we finally got it right. Yeah. You know, we also a state under God. So yeah. anyway, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have a great future. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Senator. And thank you very much for joining us for our conversation.